Alden, today is going to be an important game-changing conversation. My name is Monica Huntsbury. I'm an advisor and host for Revel 11, and it's really my pleasure to be here this morning um, to host an important conversation and honor the 50th year edition. I mean, 50th year edition, that is such a feat of diet, diet for a small planet. And it's our privilege to have the mother-daughter team of Francis Moore LePay and Anna LePay on the phone today on our Zoom link live. I'm going to give just a little bit of bio as I shared earlier, it's the, the biggest challenge we have today is there is so much important material and so many inspiring messages to cover. Um, as the audience, you're welcome to put questions or comments in the chat. The session is being recorded, but the chat will not be recorded. So a little bit about Francis Moore LePay, also known as Frankie, and we did not color coordinate today. It's the universe. Um, she is the author and co-author of 20 books about world hunger, living democracy, and the environment. Beginning with the 3 million copy Diet for a Small Planet, which was initially launched in 1971. And as I said, is now five decades later, still what I would say table stakes in the, in the industry as it comes to what's happening in our, our revolution for flu, food justice, climate justice, social justice, the intersection of all those things. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, Francis is also a co-founder of three organizations, including the Oakland-based think tank Food First and the Small Planet Institute. And again, many accolades you can read about Frances. There's no shortage of information about her um, available. Also with her is her daughter, Anna. And I love that Anna has been part of Frances' life journey and work and has chosen um, that as part of her mission. And she has been an important contributor um, to this 50th edition as well. And as we'll talk about today has really focused on um, the recipes and the community and the climate and all of her learning. And Anna, we're looking forward to hearing your voice today and sharing as well. So ladies, thank you for your time and welcome. It's an honor to have you here today. Thank you, Monica. Let's go ahead and get started um, with the, the first question. You know, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that today is election day. And um, I, I love how you talk about living democracy and that, you know, your book has really unique observations about people and culture and food and the planet. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit more about how you think about food systems and the role of food systems in this important conversation about democracy. Well, I think that one of the reasons that I, well, I was so surprised that people read my first book and, and, and that it continued is that we all need I believe we humans, we need to feel a sense of power, that we're not voiceless, that we're not victims. One, we need to feel connection with others and we need meaning in our lives. And through food, we can begin to realize that deep connection with others, meaningful participation and a voice power. And so that then also is the definition of democracy to me. Democracy is what allows each of us to experience those deep human needs, we all have opportunity to, to have that joy in life. And so I can't separate, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it's one foot or the other foot, but I can't walk forward without thinking about what is democracy. It's not simply a dull duty, you know, that we do on election day, but it is a way of living together in which we set the rules and the norms that we create so that everyone can meet their most basic physical needs, Food, yes, one of them, but also these deep emotional needs that I just defined. And so I've never been able, you know, I kind of weave back and forth in terms of my focus in a particular book, but in my life, it's it's sort of one, one, um, one part of the tapestry of life that to me is so connected. I want to shout out to Jane Goodall for giving me that term, the tapestry of life for the new chapter of Diet for a Small Planet. I think it's so much more appropriate than web, you know, because web is all uniform. And of course, life is all diverse and colorful and all different shapes and everything. So thank you, Jane Goodall. So this tapestry of life, 
Um, it is, yes, it's all about how food touches everything, but also how we make choices together to nurture that tapestry of life, to sustain our connection with a healthy planet. And without um, the voices of all, which is a definition in some sense of democracy, then we can't do that. And I, I, I wanna stop, but I, I don't wanna stop on it. <laughs> I just have to add here that in so many parts of the world, many of you know that we are going away from democracy and that in our country, not we don't just rank lower than a few U European countries on democracy's quality. No, we rank down uh, right with, um, uh, last time I looked, it was Poland, South Africa, Peru, way down the list. So I, I just want to say that it's just a rich way to live, to be always weaving those roots together, this very <laughs> visceral food and earth connection and how we together make choices through a living democracy that is actually a way of life that I'll just end with this with this quote from William Hasty, who was the first African American appellate judge. And he says, democracy is not being, it is becoming. It is easily lost, but never fully won. Its essence is eternal struggle. And I would say, I would translate that struggle to John Lewis, good trouble, right? It's good. It's exciting We to shake things up. So I hope that gives everybody a sense of how I am trying to weave <laughs> these pathways together and in my own life. It is beautifully stated. And one of the things I love is that you know, for many of us, when we think about democracy, we think about a political term and you make it about a life term and about how we all choose to live life and how we choose to come together in community and, and how, you know, why would we choose for the greater good of us, what we would not choose for ourselves. And I think there are so many beautiful nuggets and clearly anyone who has read your work knows that is based not just on your thinking, but on deep research and experience. And I, and again, I commend you for 50 years of, of, of staying true and evolving your voice. Um, I think mm -hmm. in a world where many of us zigzag, it's really, <laughs> it, it's really refreshing to see someone who um, has, has an intentional purpose for, for over five decades that has changed so many lives. Um, and, and Anna, I wanna give you a chance to comment as well. And, and maybe this would be a good question for you to lean into um, is, you know, there have been many events over the last two years that have evolved. I don't need to, to restate them, whether it's the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, you know, all of the issues that we have been facing, you know, during this time. And it's interesting to see the bridge between all ages come together in these conversations. You know, what have you noticed about the movements and how your work plays into that? Mm, that's a great question. And thanks for having us. And I was getting all emotional listening to my mom talk and hearing what you were saying about her life's work and this really historic moment for us as a family of this 50 years, but also that this anniversary of this book has landed, as you said, like not just in the context of a global pandemic and all that's meant for all of us and all of our lives, and not just at this moment of political crisis, but also in this moment of racial reckoning. I mean, it's been, I would imagine for, for, I'm speaking for many of you to say this has been a really, really intense time. And there's ways in which in such an intense time, there becomes, I think, such clarity about our, uh, what's so broken about so many of our systems. I mean, you think about last year's ongoing racial reckoning and how that exposed just uh, not that we have sort of a new moment of a, a broken criminal justice system, but how broken it has been for so long. And I think we've had a similar moment and a similar moment of awakening about our food system. It's not that the pandemic broke our food system. It's that the pandemic revealed how broken our food system was. And when you look at you know, who were the people on the front lines of uh, helping keep food on our tables, these were people who are some of the most underpaid, the most unprotected, the most exploited workers in our economy. They're the 21 and a half million food workers. And so I think 
I've been thinking a lot about how can we ensure that this moment of crisis then becomes really an opportunity to see fundamental change and doesn't just send us back to business as usual. And uh, one of the things that I've been really inspired by uh, in the last, you know, watching in the last two decades since I've been involved with this work, since my mother and I wrote uh, a, a book together and my first book um, 20 years ago, is to see how many of the of the movements that have been working to transform the food system have really come together. So we have movements working around uh, food workers' rights and uh, movements working on ecological justice and taking on the toxics industry. And we're really seeing a knitting together of those efforts. And uh, of course, you know, there's a lot of headwinds, but I do feel like this moment has really been a moment where people have really come together and really pushed for and continue to push for significant policy change and other changes in the food system. Well said, and and I, I that's one of the things I appreciate about the book as well is that you call out how many different communities are coming together and emerging all over the world to make change. One of the stories that you talked about was a, a community of women in Africa who were struggling with poverty and came together to change that. Frances, can you can you highlight that story? Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, I think are you talking about the Indian women though? Or am I getting, in the, yes, it might have been. Sorry. In Andhra Pradesh, India. Yeah. yeah. That, that was a life changing uh, moment for me. I, I uh, actually, I was there for COP21, uh, I guess. I was in India. And, and I, I thought, oh, I can go out and meet these people who I read about, um, these women in this small village. And I learned that it is called the De Deccan Development Society. And I really encourage you to look them up because I sat with them. They invited me into their little um, homes and we sat around on a, on a mat and they showed me their uh, piles of seed that they've, that they've kept. And they explained to me that a couple of decades before they were all felt completely powerless. They said, everybody in our village was hungry, everybody. We didn't have power vis-a-vis -vis our husbands, no power whatsoever. And then the women started meeting after their kids were in bed, they would gather and, and they move around in different, in different houses and they would talk about their aspirations. And they realized that they just put a tiny bit of money together, each one of them, they could, they could rent some land, they could eventually buy some land. And then they got help to convert uh, knowledge of how to move away from these nutritional crops and, and monocrops into multiple, they walked me out in their fields with 21 different varieties of legumes and everything of, healthy things and they even got their own radio station so they started broadcasting what they were doing and now it's in 75 villages and um but when i left the village i, I just was just overwhelmed with, with um, just joy and an encouragement of what i'd heard and i walked out and i could hear them running behind me and they said wait 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 we forgot to tell you the most important thing <laughs> and they said we forgot to tell you that the most important thing that we got from our women's group was courage. <laughs> and I just love that because that's become a theme song of my life that really um, courage is contagious. And that um, I could talk more, I, I don't want to uh, talk too much on this, on this story, but that at the root of it all is that how do we find, how do we risk doing what we thought we could not do? And one way is to be around people who are taking risks that we couldn't imagine ourselves taking. And that, oh, maybe I could do that. So look for people who are gutsier than you and hang out with them. That's my advice. <laughs> I, I, it's such a beautiful story and so poignant on so many levels. And you're right. And that's one of the things I, I love about our Revo 11 community is uh, we are bringing together people who care and want to make change. So back for a minute to, you know, what you both have been talking about related to food systems, democracy, movements. If there are individuals on this phone who are on this call who are wanting to take action or think about a career change where they could have more impact, it feels like so much is changing so fast. Do you have any tips or recommendations for starting points or are there any interesting fields emerging that you would like to highlight? Anna, do you want to start? Sure, sure. I mean, 
Huh, that's a great question. And what comes up for me as you're asking it is that the the sort of opportunities are limitless. You know, I, I back in the before times, uh, before COVID, I used to uh, talk to a lot of college uh, students and it was one of my favorite parts of my job was speaking to college students and they would talk about, you know, their dreams of what they wanted to do with their lives and that they had this and that many of them had interest in food. And I said, you know, if you're trying to change a system, no matter where you choose as your entry point, you can be part of a systems change. And what I meant by that is if, you know, if your passion is as a chef and a cook, part of the way you can change the system is to bring people the joy of eating real food again and getting us off of an ultra processed diet controlled by just a handful of companies. And, uh, you know, if your passion is actually uh, getting your hands in the dirt, you can be part of the global movement to, uh, to, to, decarbonize our, our, our farming systems and to uh, put pesticides into the dustbins of history. You know, you can be part of that movement. If your passion is that you love reading legal briefs, God bless you, and you know how to write, you know, legal text, like we need lawyers in the courtroom to, on all different fronts. If you love policy work, there's so much incredible policy. So it is really limitless. It's about finding that kind of sweet spot where you look at where your passions lie, uh, where opportunities in your own life are, and what change is needed and find your place there. And, uh, you know, I could, I could give some more specific examples. But, you know, to me, um, that's what's exciting about trying to be part of what I really see as a global movement to address the, the, re- crazy fact that 37% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from our food system. And yet here we are as COP26 is happening and there isn't a single day dedicated to talk about how to address the 37% of emissions coming from food. You know, the fact that globally, the Lancet did a a global survey of worldwide deaths and found one in five deaths now worldwide come from diet related causes. And we're at a moment of complete crisis and, and there are lots of ways to plug in, including just what you choose to eat for lunch in a couple of hours. That's great, thank you. Francis, anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, I've just been so touched recently in particular by young women running for office and doing really gutsy things in that regard. One of my heroes is a young woman who was who was one of the founders of, speaking of climate, right? One of the founders of divestment at Harvard. And she said, oh, well, yeah, I, I really did all I could at Harvard, but I wanna go back to my hometown. And she said, well, the way to live in my hometown in Maine, the way to be in Maine, I think I'll just run for office. <laughs> and I thought, well, <laughs> some people would think about getting a job at the local store, but no, why don't I run for office? I could stay. And she ran in a conservative district on a Green New Deal platform and on jobs and solar energy for, you know, for for building solar, you know, on on schools. And she won. She won. And then they a year after that, they passed the Green New Deal there. And guess what? Now she's in the Senate, in the main Senate, and she's still in her 20s. So this is Chloe Maxman is her name, Chloe Maxman. But, um, yeah, I've just been so impressed um, another story about a young woman is Katie Fahey. Um, and if you want to write this down, they made, uh, somebody made a great movie about her called Slay the Dragon. And she too, in her 20s, she was really, really upset about how Michigan's uh, district lines were rigged and gerrymandered, as they call it, so that, that um, your vote didn't count equally with, with the next person. And so she put a little note on her Facebook page and then she got thousands of people and ultimately they collected 425,000 signatures to get an initiative on the ballot to create an independent uh, body that would draw the district lines instead of having them done in a partisan way. And she succeeded. So the movie's called Slay the Dragon. So I just, these are just two people, but they're you know, nobody would have imagined, oh, yeah, Katie's going to change the world or, oh, yeah, Chloe. Uh, they just went for it, you know, and saw an opportunity. So that, that's um, that's what I mean. I mean, just l- keep those people in our hearts and inspire us. 
I think those are great examples. And you're right. I have been encouraged by so many women running for office. And even those that don't win, they're changing the conversation, right? And they're they're passing the baton to that next generation of, of possibilities, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I want to move into the topic of climate. And I'm going to read the opening paragraph to your 50th year edition here, because it's really, it's really powerful and it speaks from your place of conviction. It's, it says, I began this journey with the realization that growing and eating plant-centered diets was a great choice. Today, it is a no contest necessity. Either we now make a big turn or life on earth as we know it is gone forever. And, and I do feel like we just have to pause and take a breath and that's heavy. Help us unpack that, please. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the big awakenings for me, I, I was aware of how our food system was contributing to the climate crisis, and that alone would justify my saying that. Um, and I became much more aware of how the same processes that are um, creating greenhouse gas emissions from our food system, as I said, 37%, I just said, um, they are destroying species as well. And that 40% of insects, for example, insect species are threatened with extinction in the next few decades. And something like 80% of the mammals uh, that have already been destroyed by our uh, clearing of forest and clearing of land and to often to grow feed crops that then return to us a tiny fraction of uh, what they have just, I'll just give you one statistic there that uh, is mind blowing that we use 80% of our agricultural land to produce um, a livestock, but they supply us only 18% of our calories. So that waste is what first woke me up as a young woman. Wait, 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 that's crazy waste. But what I realize now is that very process is, is, is destroying so many other life forms that, and as you know, as many of uh, all of us in the circle probably know, uh, rainforest, which is the, which is the deposit, you know, which that's not the right word, which is the center of biodiversity in the world or a rainforest. And they're being felled too, to grow uh, feed or to graze livestock. So um, that is what I mean. It's just so much, more than I could have imagined when I wrote the first diet for a small planet, the destructive nature of our food system that then as Anna's already pointed out, is supplying us with a diet that is literally killing us. That is really, we've turned our, the first species, you know, we're the brightest, but we've actually turned our food system into a health threat. And that is all unnecessary. So that is what I've tried to just expand my, my, uh, my communication of how urgent and how just every choice we make in this arena and in the policy is touches so many aspects of survival on our planet. We appreciate your brave voice. We we do, and and your your sense of urgency that you're imploring. Um, you know, people are attached to their diets and and their meat and their patterns. Um, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on what some of the resistance is around change related to the choices we make on our plate. Well, I'm sure, Anna, do you want to start? Go, yeah. Go for yeah, sure. So, I mean, actually, I feel like from my experience of connecting with people around the country and around the world is a real openness versus experiencing actually resistance. And I've been really curious to try to understand, well, then why aren't we seeing more change? You know, why aren't we seeing more people choosing the kinds of, you know, the diet for a small planet diet? And I think more of the reason why can be explained by not individuals resistance to change or you know any kind of individual failing to really connect the dots ourselves and more about the food environments in which we live which is that you know most of us live in places where actually uh, uh, being able to get access to healthy whole foods uh, and uh, is limited uh, and that you know just since my mom wrote diet for a small planet think about what 
lives, how lives for all of us, but particularly for women have changed. I mean, when my mom wrote Diet for a Small Planet and just after that, she founded a nonprofit. She was living on a nonprofit salary in San Francisco, raising two kids as a single mother and was able to uh, not, you know, have to work 70 hours a week and be able to actually you know, have time to cook our meals. And, and that was uh, because the economy was different because people were, uh, 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 you know, not having to work as many hours as they are now. So part of it, I think that kind of resistance to change has to do with the environments in which we live. But then the second part has to do with the messages we hear. So I was just looking at the budgets for essentially the marketing arm of the American beef industry, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. It's the, the trade association that anybody selling beef in this country pays into. It's part of what's called a checkoff program. And uh, their budget was something on the order of magnitude of 100 times the budget of the Plant-Based Foods Association, <laughs> the trade group for plant-based foods in the US, just to give you one you know, tiny example. And so it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that in 2015, when there was the last big debate uh, conversation uh, about how to update and edit the U.S. dietary guidelines, you know, what many of us trust as the kind of absolute, you know, concrete messages about what is a healthy diet, it shouldn't come as any surprise that it was impossible for advocates to get in a message of eat less meat. And instead it was, I think, eat lean meat or, but that message wasn't in there. So most Americans don't realize that the typical one of us is eating twice as much protein as our bodies can even use. And so that's a form of food waste that most of us don't realize that you don't even need to eat <laughs> meat to get, you know, ample protein in your diet as my mother and many others have been saying for decades. Right. So I think it's less to me about you know, how do we get past people's resistance? And it's more about how do we change the environment? How do we change access? How do we actually, you know, align ourselves with worker movements to say we should have reasonable working hours again, and we need, you know, people need a living wage. And how do we really take on the lobbying and marketing power of an industry that is really uh, informing what so many people think is a healthy diet? I really appreciate that reframe. And I, I loved one of the stories in the book about a, a friend who was ordering this really healthy salad with all kinds of, you know, lettuce and legumes and kale and you name it. And the person said, well, do you want a protein? Right. And it, it shows you how deep rooted this message about protein equals beef or meat is in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, Francis, is there anything you'd like to add to that, that story? Well, I, I agree with everything Anna said, and I also sense that, that um, and it's woven, it, I think it was in there in what she said too, but I just want to stress it, that, that people think that making this shift is, you that, you know, to what is a meal without meat it requires a lot of work to sort of, to figure out how to be a cook in a different world. And so one of the things that Anna and I try to do is to create, you know, to really share very simple and, and really encourage people just to, you know, experiment and try see what your family likes, a little more of this, a little more of that, and, and always make leftovers, <laughs> lots of leftovers, because then it's so easy to have that later in the week, you know, so, um, but so it's changing, it's all the things that Anna said, I, I totally agree. And it's also like any change of habit, we think, oh, how do I, how do I do this, you know? And so that's why I often say in many, many things when we're talking about changing ourselves to find just one buddy, you know, just one friend who, who maybe is like you, who wants to eat more in the plant world and you try different recipes and you compare them and, and just to get started and what do you need in the kitchen? And uh, we did work hard, Anna, right? In the, in the new book to, to just in the opening section before the recipes to communicate this message. And here are some you know, these basics to have in the kitchen to make it easy for you. So well, that, let's, uh, let's skip right. over to that part. I do want to talk a little bit about that. And I'm just going to read a few of the type, the ones that I am already teed up to try in my kitchen, white bean, kale, fettuccine, spicy peanut sauce, golden gate minestrone. This one looks amazing. Bryant slow braised mustard greens. And it tells about the process of creating these beautiful recipes and also working to preserve what was in the original edition. It sounds like an amazing process. 
Sure. Well, I can I can say the process began with uh, looking at the recipes in the original edition, which I had not done for several decades, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and realizing that of course we have learned so much more about about healthy food since my mother wrote Diet for a Small Planet, and and really wanting to do. Uh, two things. One, wanting to reflect that learning, what, what we've learned about how to eat a healthy plant-centered diet. But two, I wanted to really have the book also reflect the voices of this incredibly diverse uh, world of people, of chefs, of cookbook authors and restaurateurs who themselves reflect kind of the forward edges of plant-centered eating and reflect that this kind of plant-centered eating is part of diets all around the world. And so we invited uh, 13 of our favorite cookbook authors and chefs, although I say I could have invited, you know, many, many others. There's so many great people out there to contribute a recipe to make the book, I hope, feel a bit like a conversation among friends. And then we looked at those original recipes and I did all of this work with a woman named Wendy Lopez, who if there's nutritionists among you, I really recommend you all taking a look at her work. Her website's called Food Heaven Made Easy. And <laughs> she's this wonderful, wonderful woman who I've, who I've known for a very long time. And she's a recipe developer. She's been really working to diversify dietetics as part of her life mission. But she is an incredible recipe developer as I am not. And uh, so she worked with me and we looked at those original recipes and we thought, what do we need to change in them to really reflect what we know about nutrition, the world of nutrition today? And probably will surprise none of you who followed this to know that when my mother was writing Diet for a Small Planet, there was a lot of messaging, a lot of anti-fat messaging. You know, we need, need to be eating low fat cottage cheese and low drinking low fat milk and, uh, and uh, eating margarine. And of course, what we know now, thanks to fabulous investigative reporting, is that a lot of that messaging against fat was actually uh, developed by the sugar industry to try to deflect attention from sugar <laughs> and place the blame on fat. Uh, and, you know, now uh, I'll put a, a link in the chat to a fabulous uh, article I recommend you all for you, if you want to know this history and don't already know it for you to read. But so we took out all the margarine, we took out all the references to low fat anything uh, was uh, one of the other changes. And then the other really, uh, in a way, big change, although it didn't mean a lot of, um, wasn't a lot of words that we had to change. But we when my mother wrote Diet for a Small Planet, there was also this presumption that it was hard to get protein from a plant-centered diet, that you needed to do that protein complementarity, and you had to figure that out at your at you know at each meal. And so each of those original recipes, if any of you have the original, you'll know at the bottom of the recipe, it, it tells you what ingredients are complementary proteins. And now, of course, we know that you don't have to be so worried about getting enough protein from eating when you eat vegetarian food. And so we took out all references to protein complementarity, and we hope the book feels even more accessible as a result. So those are just some of the changes. Also, there is mention of soy grits or soy flour <laughs> um, and a few other ingredients that I knew if I couldn't find those ingredients in my Berkeley natural food store, then probably most people couldn't. And again, we were striving for accessibility. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. that. Me too. <laughs> well, it, it, it's beautiful. Now I'm going to, I'm going to pull in a comment from the chat, which I thought was clever. Um, Monica Smith writes, you know, I wish there was a recipe for convincing your spouse family to go with a plant-based diet. Any tips oh. on that? <laughs> Well, I can jump in to say that I have it easy in that my husband, uh, when he was in college, uh, had a crush on a, on, a, on a young woman who uh, told him that he had to read this book called Diet for a Small Planet, uh, which he did, and he became a vegetarian, and, but he didn't get the girl, but he did become a vegetarian. <laughs> or, or, we, we eat fish, so we're, we're pescatarians. But um, uh, anyway, so I have it easy with my family, but I will say, you know, again, we are living in a time where there's so many, uh, so many um, resources to cook delicious vegetarian food. And I think that we take a really big tent approach. It's not all or nothing, even if it's just uh, having a, 
choosing a couple evenings a week to center your, your diets, uh, you know, on a plant centered meal, for instance, I would give a huge shout out to a fabulous new um, newsletter from the New York Times that Tejal Rao has developed every Thursday, fabulous recipe suggestions, all uh, plant centered. Mark Bittman has great resources. Uh, our, every single chef that we uh, include in the book has cookbooks, every single one of them I'd recommend. So those are just some resources I'd suggest. You are giving us some action-packed information and great, great tips as well. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit. And, and I want to talk a little bit about, you know, your own sense of inspiration and hope. And one of the things that you talk so eloquently about, Francis, is the concept of believing is seeing. Can you expand on, on that vision for our audience today? Yes, uh, thank you so much. This is the center of my life in so many ways because when I was that 26 year old, uh, the world was just on fire with fear, fear of scarcity. I mean, it was like, oh, we were just overdoing it. And it's so unethical. Many that said, the young people said, I can't have children. It was so scary. Uh, there just wasn't enough. And so, I realized, of course, I went to the library, did the, <laughs> added the numbers and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, there is enough food for us. But that realization that, the, that even though it wasn't true, it wasn't factual, that just the image, this is a message about fear, this was the, the power of ideas, the believing is seeing, that we humans don't see the world as it is, but as we are. Um, Einstein, I, I draw on Einstein on this too. Yes, he said, it is theory which decides what we can observe. Okay, that's the frame that decides whether we can see it. And uh, the Hopi Indian said, he who tells a story rules the world. And so what is the story that we are communicating? What is the story that so sort of limits our, our vision? And so that's what I've been working on <laughs> in some ways all my life, that, that we... We, I, I think of the dominant frame through which we are blinded is that I think of them as the three S's, scarcity, and uh, we're stuck. <laughs> the three S's are things are scarce, we're stuck, and we're all separate. And what we're moving into and what Anne has been talking about, and I think all of us who would tune in today are sensing is that we are we're rejecting that false frame that so limits our vision. And we are moving toward what I think of as an ecological worldview of the three C's, <laughs> that we are all connected, that that change and that changes the nature of life, and that therefore we are all co-creating moment to moment. And so that that's so freeing, isn't it? That we're not stuck, that um, that we that we are part of continuous change and so that means that if we're all connected then every choice we make and don't make changes the world so i like to say the only choice we don't have from that ecological worldview the only choice we don't have is whether to change the world because we are and are in action as much as our actions so um if somebody is watching all the, you know somebody's effect somebody's taking a signal from us so i think that's really the centerpiece of my life's work is how to help us see the beliefs that are so ingrained that we can't even um, recognize them. And part of that has to do with our own nature, the core idea that not only is there scarcity of goods out there for us, but there's scarcity of goodness in us. And so I, I claim that if we, if we start with that, um, it leads us into a spiral of powerlessness. And the opposite of that <laughs> is not, oh, yeah, we're all great. The opposite of that is recognizing that we have now proven through our social history that human beings can be incredibly cooperative and, and just brilliantly focused on fairness and embodying these very positive qualities. And we know that we can be unspeakably cruel. What what shows up depends on the rules and the norms that we create. And we know what those norms are now, those rules are now that bring out the best in us. And that's the definition of democracy. But I feel like I'm giving a little speech here, so I'll try to shut up. No, but, it's welcome. Keep going. <laughs> but that idea that that was what woke me up as a 26-year-old is that, wait a minute, 
we're living in a false frame and we see what we, you know, when Paul Ehrlich wrote the population bomb and said, we've, you know, we've overrun the earth. I'm sure that, you know, he really, really believed it and found some evidence that really convinced him it was true. Um, so I, I just think all of us then all the time need to be really thinking, okay, what is some assumption I have now that maybe I should, I should rethink and um, keeping open to that idea that maybe that we've um, had our view filtered through a lens that prevented us from seeing possibility. And I'll just end on this little sermon here, but what takes me to the theme of possibility that if we live in this world of continuous change in which everything is connected, it's not possible to know what's possible. It's not possible to know what's possible. And if that's true, then we are free <laughs> to go for the world we want because nobody can say, oh no, that, that can't happen. Uh, as long as there's a chance that it might, human beings can often step up for it. I think that's so lovely. And I, I love how you speak in the book about not being an optimist, but being a possibility, a possibilist. <laughs> and 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 you're right, because you know, as you've shared from your own life examples, 50 years ago, you would not have known that today here is where you would be and that we might still be having some of the same conversations and that you would be next to your daughter in this journey. And so, you know, thank goodness you stepped into a reframe and a, a belief system that honored what you felt was possible and the world you wanted to create and, and that vision of interconnectedness and how we can continue to draw toward that. You know, for either of you to comment on if somebody is feeling like, I don't know what to do, right? That inaction is also inaction, as you as you mentioned. You know, what is a what is a good place for someone to start in terms of mustering that that courage or that reframe? You want to start, Anna? Sure. I mean, you were talking, Monica, about how my mom could never have imagined, you know, where she would be now. I mean, when she started the Diet for a Small Planet book project, it wasn't even a book. It was going to be a pamphlet she was going to post on the telephone poles in Berkeley and, you know, be read by a couple dozen people. So the, you know, I think one of the lessons that I've learned from watching my mom's life all these years, uh, but also from the incredible people who she and I met when we wrote our book together, Hope's Edge, is that, you know, you don't, you don't start whatever the work is that is yours to do because you know you are going to, you know, write the book that's going to sell millions of copies and 50 years later get to, you know, have great conversations about it. You write the book that you write because you feel like you have something burning inside you need, you need the world to know. Um, you don't, you know, when we met Wangari Mathai, an uh, incredible environmental leader who founded the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, went on to, you know, mobilize uh, thousands of women across Kenya, inspire you know, women around the world end up uh, being honored with the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, when we met Wangari, uh, you know, it was at a time before she was internationally recognized at a time when she didn't even know if her movement was going to make it into the next year, you know, where her organizers that were teaching uh, uh, villagers across the country of Kenya how to uh, farm organically were being threatened with arrest for daring to teach, you know, non-pesticide agriculture. I mean, she didn't do that work because she knew one day she would be honored with the Nobel Peace Prize. So I think so much of it is, you know, tapping into that, you know, that that part of oneself that has that sense of what is it that you feel you can you want to bring into the world. But I wanted to add one more thought about this, like how do you how you do you get out of these mind sets and mind frames? And this was kind of a guiding question for my mom and me when we wrote Hope's Edge. And one of the ways that we found that people that we met were able to break out of these limited worldviews was through sharing story and learning that sense of possibility from those stories. And so I just want to end this little comment with a story, which was uh, we, one of the places that my mother and I went to for our book was uh, the fourth largest city of Brazil, Belo Horizonte. Uh, and we traveled to Belo Horizonte because we had heard that public servants there that elected officials in the city had changed their mind frame about food. And out of that 
change of frame came all of this innovation and in policy. And so what I mean by that is these elected officials were looking at the rates of poverty and hunger and infant mortality and maternal well-being, and they saw that there was a lot of hunger <laughs> and a lot of just suffering among citizens in their city. And they said, wait a second, wait a second, let's change our frame. Instead of just letting the market just kind of work the way it works, we have been elected by the citizens of the city to represent everybody, not just the wealthy and not just the well-fed. So what would it look like if we saw our role in city government differently? And if we saw our role in city government as a role of making food accessible, changing those food environments I talked about earlier. And so by the time we got there, these leaders had done all these really incredible things. They had um, looked at food waste in the city. And instead of just like letting the food go to waste, they saw that a lot of that waste was actually highly nutritious. So eggshells and manioc leaves, and they transformed it into highly nutritious flour they gave to uh, women in, uh, 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 in, uh, in, you know, as part of um, their prenatal care. They uh, looked at all this city owned land and gave it over to farmers for free in exchange for those farmers going into uh, more low income neighborhoods. And they looked at how to bring healthier food into schools and on and on and on. And by the time we got there, the rates of infant mortality had dropped and women's nutrition had gone up and hunger in the city had gone down. And as we were concluding our last interview with this woman, Adriana Aranja, who'd been kind of at the forefront of this work, uh, we asked her, you know, she knew how successful they were going to be when they started all of this. And she's, she's answering this question in Portuguese, of course, which my mother and I do not speak. And she's, her eyes are starting to well up and she's starting to kind of get really emotional. And we're waiting for our translator, you know, to tell us, what is she saying? What is she saying? And what she said that day was she said, you know, when I started this work, I, I knew how much hunger there was in the world, how much hunger there was in our city. What I did not know was how easy it is to end it. And to be clear, she did not mean easy. Like this woman worked harder than like anybody I've ever met. I mean, easy, not in the sense that it didn't mean you had to work your butt off every day, but easy in the sense that once those leaders shifted how they saw their responsibility, that all these solutions became easy to discover, to uncover, to implement. And um, so that stuck with me all these years that there is that, that power that comes from shifting our mindsets and the kind of possibility that gets unleashed. Well, Anna, you are a beautiful storyteller and um, you've touched my heart this morning and I'm sure you've touched many. And, and um, we have time for just a few more comments and questions, but I, I just wanna add that, you know, you know, you and Francis both donating your time for free this morning to share your stories with this beautiful community at Revel 11 is what also changes lives. So thank you. I want to read a comment from the chat that says, I just want to say that your book inspired my family for three generations. That says how important your book is. Amazing. Thank you. I, I love that um, you have many fans, old and new, joining here this morning. Um, one question that I'll, I'll probably end with and then let you both make any final comments is how do you, um, and this comes from the chat, how do you maintain your own sense of hope around this challenging work? What practices or outlets do you have that allow you to continue um, in a way that helps to energize and nourish you? Beautiful. Thank you, thank you. I definitely seek what I call stories of possibility, uh, certainly going to Brazil um, and to meet Adra uh, Adriana, who Anna just introduced you to was one of those choices. So all of my writing, all of my research doesn't just you know, cover the big statistical pictures, but really what are people doing? Because we model ourselves out, out you know, from each other. And if we see others like ourselves in action, we can believe that it's possible for us. And so I couldn't stress that factor more. And that's why, you know, I think the buddy system of anybody on the call who, you know, has an idea that they want to do more to in this do or die moment, you know, in this historic moment where there is such awareness of multiple crises, so many opportunities for positive change to, to really connect in that way and then, and then make commitments to each other. Uh, we are such social creatures. And I think the other thing that I was thinking that 
uh, helps explain what um, uh, my, my life journey, given that I want to say I made a D on my first English paper in college. So I did not expect to be a writer of 20 books. <laughs> so, um, so not to be stuck by our, you know, we, what we don't do well, like I, I didn't stop with that D, but also I realized that I had to have my own questions. And um, I, after I was part of the war on poverty, I was a community organizer uh, during a time when I really felt like my government was on my side. And But then I, I realized that I had to go deeper and I started developing my own questions. And I think, I don't know if, because I can't see your faces of all the people who are out there, but if, if you know, um, if you have a question that you have to answer, it will motivate you to learn new things and meet new people. Um, we're learning animals. And so I think one way of saying it, instead of thinking, oh, what am I going to do to help this poor, you know, what are the questions I have that I want to get answered so that I can find that entry point is the term that Anna used that entry point that will that will help shift the the energy of my community and therefore our world. That's so I don't have to do it all, but I just have to find my questions, and I can find my entry point. And I'm sure that um, the people who are drawn to this um, already are doing that <laughs> too. So I don't mean to sound presumptuous, but in my life, that's the that's been the the pathway finding my questions. I love that. So attainable. Anna? No, well, I think this question, how do we maintain our sense of hope around this challenging work really gets me thinking about uh, how, how we think of what hope even means. And, uh, you know, when I, when my mother and I talk about hope, and that was the name of this book we wrote together, Hope's Edge. I remember when we were working on that book, now this is many years ago, I had this really fixed idea of what hope meant. And I, I thought it was really for people whose heads were either way in the clouds and just not paying attention, <laughs> you know, or their heads were way in the, the sand, you know, not paying attention in a different way that I thought that if you were really to be clear eyed about the state of things, how could you feel hope? There's so much to, to feel so uh, alarmed by. And that was kind of my fixed idea about hope. And uh, we had, were taking this journey together, uh, meeting with incredible leaders around the world. And we had this really intense uh, time in, in uh, 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 the Punjab in India, where he'd gone to connect with folks that were working to help uh, Indian farmers in the Punjab shift away from reliance on pesticides that had so devastated their health, devastated their ecosystems, uh, the seeds, the pesticides, the fertilizers had so indebted many of them uh, that um, they were, uh, uh, you know, there was an epidemic of farmers actually committing suicide drink through drinking the pesticides. And we were with these organizers that were trying to help farmers see a different path. And we had just spent this entire day hearing testimony from Punjabi farmers about how impacted they'd been by chemical agriculture. And uh, we saw the work that this uh, farmer organizer was doing to try to help these, these folks learn a different path and get on a different path. And the next day, after this intense day of testimony, we were standing on this train platform and like the sun was just coming up and we're, we're uh, with this incredible farmer organizer who was one of the most hopeful to my impression, hopeful people I'd ever met. He just had this incredible exuberance. And I asked him, you know, how is it, where does he find his hope? You know, we had just heard this incredible devastation of people who he cared for and loved. And we saw the land and how impacted it was. And he, he essentially said to us then something that has stayed with my mom and me all these years, which is for him, hope didn't come from weighing the evidence of is the good out winning the bad, but hope comes from taking action. And we wrote in Hope's Edge that uh, hope is more verb than noun. And this idea that you actually become hope through engaging with the world, through whatever it is that you're choosing to do to make a difference. And so when I think about where my hope comes from, it comes from, from that. And um, that isn't to say that I don't have some days where I don't want to get out of bed because I, you know, it feels the world feels it gets coming down on top of my head. Um, but it does mean that when I, when I kind of, where I shore up my energy, it comes from that sense of um, by engaging every day that that is where my hope comes from. 
I love that hope comes from taking action. And I, I love how you ask the question underneath the question, like not just how do I find hope, but what is hope? Mm -hmm. Francis, I know you're dying to say something. Jump in. I, I love that and those memories. And, and I also um, have learned that neuroscientists tell us that hope actually organizes our brains towards solutions. <laughs> So telling a solution story to me is a revolutionary act. It's, it's really, it has power. And, and so I, I like Anna, you know, I've, our, my whole association with the word has changed. And that idea that hope is what we become together in action is actually, that was on our website at the Small Planet for a long time. You know, what Anna just said is our sort of founding motto because Anna and I together founded the Small Planet Institute. So I love it that you reminded me of that story, Anna. Well, you must have many proud mom moments. I love that you are a mother daughter team and, and continue to take action and help inspire and, and change and create change. Um, we are going to wrap. I have just a few more things to add as, as we close, but if you have not purchased your copy of Diet for a Small Planet, I encourage you to do that. And it's uh, an amazing gift to give as well in this time of, of gifting and, and Thanksgiving and other things that we may be celebrating. So it was such a pleasure to be in conversation with both of you. Thank you again for donating your time, donating so much of your um, talented um, experience and energy and thinking and imparting that with our community. I know those who joined us live today received so much. And I know those who will listen to the recording, which many always do, will, will benefit as well. And there's lovely notes of, of thanks that we'll share. Um, Monica, do you want to go ahead, Monica Smith, and share what's coming up next on Rebel 11? Thank you, everyone.